bless you richly. And uh, I'm convinced the more I study scripture and, and look at scripture is that we are, in fact, all ministers. Praise the Lord. That is scriptural. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Paul says this, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay, King James says slay, I believe it means fraud of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He says that the time comes when spiritual maturity is a necessity. And that's, I love the way the Lord does it. He never puts us in a place. He never opens a door for us. He never directs us without empowering us to do exactly what he wants us to do and what he tells us to do. I remember when my pastor came to me and wanted me to teach the new converts course in the New Bedford Church. And uh, he said, Friday night, I'd like you to start teaching that new converts classes were for new people that came, came in, got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and didn't know anything about anything. And it was like, and I was, I don't know how long I have been walking with Jesus, but I really didn't feel qualified to, to uh, be able to, uh, to do it. But lo and behold, as we prayed and sought the face of the Lord, God gave me the grace and, and uh, help me to navigate and uh, you know I had 14 15 people in the classroom and it was just uh, it was very rich it was very fulfilling and I can honestly say my knowledge of, of the scripture now is because of those instances and throughout my life God has never opened the door for me to walk through that he did not give me the power the grace whatever you want to call it to in fact fulfill his will he wouldn't be God if he did if he did anything otherwise but he will never force himself on us. He'll never force our, himself on us to make us do what he wants us to do. We have that choice. And so Paul says the time comes when spiritual uh, maturity is, uh, is uh, uh, initiated, necessary. And uh, so we're not blown about with all these different kinds of doctrines. Don't ever be afraid if somebody asks you a question, a biblical question, how come this or... And you don't know the answer. Don't ever get paralyzed because of that. I think, you know, if I ask somebody something, rather than give me a canned answer or an answer I may know or sense that they don't know what they're talking about, I, I just assume t them tell me, I really don't know the answer to that. What I've done and practiced to do that if I uh, go on a Bible study or having a conversation with somebody I'm maybe in contact with more often than not, I'll say, I, I'm I've never been asked that. Let me look it up for you. And I make sure I write it down and, and, uh, and, uh, and I make sure that I get back to them. This is, this is what I found. I've, I've gone home and uh, researched the question and then ended up, you know, get their email address and then sat down and uh, emailed them a book. Uh, you know, my, my answer and my responses and the ins and the outs of it. So people will respect you if you tell them, I don't know, but I'll find out. Amen. Because none of us know everything. And then no matter how, how uh, uh, I, I kind of like that challenge, sometimes I'll read something, somebody asks a question about something, and I'll, I'll say, that's, a good, that's an interesting question. But he gives you something to study about, gives you something to, to, to look at the scripture for. So he goes on after that. He lets us to know that there's all kinds of doctrine out there. Everybody's got an opinion about everything. And... Uh, we don't have to fear the stature of men, whether they've got their, their degrees in theology. And, uh, and even if everybody else is looking at them like, man, they walk on water and they really know their stuff. We don't have to fear that. You know why we don't have to fear that or be concerned about that? Because Jesus said it this way. I'll, at the time it's necessary, I'll put the words in your mouth. You say, wow, would he do that with me? Yes, sir. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, if you're praying, if you're exercising it now in the house, you ever have somebody during a service, you ever have the Holy Ghost speak to you during a service to go pray for somebody in the service? Did that, did that ever happen to anybody? Yes, sir. Did you do it? 
No comment, huh? 50-50. This is the training ground where we're comfortable with one another. We won't ridicule each other. We won't laugh at each other. Of course, if you happen to be insecure, you may feel that way, but it, it doesn't, it's usually doesn't come from his side, it comes from the other guy's side. Know who the other guy is? Yes, sir. The liar, the deceiver, the accuser. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Notice the key words that he uses in verse 16 where he's talking about the whole body. You know, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about her. Not about him. Not about, you know, it's, we're part of the whole body of Christ. Right. Jesus is the head of the body. We're his arms. We're his feet. We're his mouthpiece. He filled us with the Holy Ghost and has redeemed us. Not so we can just go to church and do our thing and pray and be faithful in the, in the external ins and outs and do's and don'ts of the Christian faith, biblical. We're in the Bible, we're doing it, we're living it, if we say it that way. But he saved us to engage his priority, and his priority is to seek and save that which is lost. So Paul says the whole body, he says every joint, every part, maketh increase. So it's, it's awesome how the Lord doesn't leave anybody out. You know, in the world, sometimes you might feel intimidated by, you might uh, go to a training class or go to a meeting and, and you feel out of place or you feel you, you know, you don't know enough or you, you might, you know, go sit in the back of the room because you don't want to be called out or anything like that. But in the kingdom, I'm part of the body. I mean, cut your, cut your big toe off tonight when you get home and see how good you walk tomorrow. Take off your thumb. And see how good see see how good your 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 hand is and how it can function. Mm -hmm. We're all part of the body of Christ. You can read about it in First Corinthians chapter twelve if you haven't read that in a while, where he talks about the gifts of the Spirit and, and you know some of us are the little fingers, some of us are the arm, and so on and so forth. You know, and God puts us; He fitly frames us together as joints, as as marrow, as as you know, people that have more gifting than others, hello, talents, five talents, two talents, one talent. So God has given each and every one of us giftings to be used in his kingdom and to be used, more importantly, to minister to people. When he starts pouring his spirit out upon all flesh, it's definitely going to have to be all hands on deck. And I'm afraid people that are not engaged in the all hands all on deck a mental attitude, psych themselves up, okay, we can do this. How the scripture talks about if you can't run with the footman, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? Mm -hmm. And when people start coming into this building and there is a need to, uh, to give them a Bible study, a quick, easy Bible study, and, and then have a new converts course so they can go deeper and it's more intense. And some of God may use some of you guys to, to in fact do that. And Sister Pat, you're never old. You never get too old where you can't share the gospel, the good news. Amen. You say, well, in my life, I don't have opportunity. I don't. Again, every time I try to think of an excuse, it brings me right back to how much am I praying for God to use me in evangelism? Am I just waiting for it to happen? And I'm sitting there saying, oh, well, nothing's happening. Or do I spend my time letting him know, God, give me, give me what you feel for the people. Give, give me what you feel for the souls that I see every single day. Let me see them like you see them. Even people at work that you might think are out in left field somewhere. There may be people in your life that you can't stomach and you can't stand. You know what? That person that you can't stomach and you can't stand... They're going to hell if they don't find Jesus before this is all over. Man. I don't know about you, but I, even my worst enemy, I don't want to go, them to go to hell, Brother Allen. I have no idea how it's going to be other than what's based in the Scripture and what I feel in the Holy Ghost, how, how, how horrific that is going to be. And for me, being filled with His Spirit 
and really not engaging to try to capture somebody from that darkness and, and win somebody, it, it just does something to you. I can, I can only imagine what Jesus feels as his church just sits and warms the seat and, and there's hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Well, thank God that he's showing us this. Thank God he's been speaking to us, giving us revelation and, and, and empowering us to say, look, you, you feel my presence. I, I'm speaking to you. I, I'm offering it to you. Here it is. And all he's waiting for us to say, like Isaiah said, you hear that part about Brother Gonzalez, what he said about Isaiah? That's the first time I heard that. That Isaiah was only speaking kind of what he what he thought he was supposed to say, and the rest of the time, if I understood it, he was you know, kind of keeping his mouth shut. Yeah. So God called him on the carpet and, and said, "You know, who's going to go for me?" You know, and finally he feels convicted. He had to remove the, the the King Uzziah and get him out of his life. I think Brother Gonzalez said he it seems to believe that they were related somehow. God, my friend, will take things out of our lives to get us in the field or get us on track. I can't stand here before you and say, I want to go to heaven if I'm not engaged in his will and in his interest. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And, and as I said Sunday, he brought us up to this point. We've been tickled in the Holy Ghost flesh-wise. We talk in tongues. We've, we've had some great times, great word, great fellowship. Now it's time to take everything he's taught us and imparted to us all these years and say, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to go to work. It starts in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. It starts in prayer. Nothing can stop the increase in, a, in, in the body when we make personal evangelism a priority. And it will, it will make this church the most exciting church in this city. You know why? New people will come and they'll be born again of water and of spirit. You, you ever watch a new convert that really gets it how they are in, ser in the service? We've seen a couple of people that have come and have gotten born again and they, they, they lit up the service. They worship loud. They're boisterous. They're on fire for God. They, they smile. They have a, always have a testimony, something to say. New babies get loud and new babies just light the place up. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's yikes. <laughs> but I can't wait, Brother Allen, for this place to be filled with new Amen. converts Amen. that aren't afraid to worship God, that aren't concerned about what people think about them or what people say about them. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Growth is guaranteed. If we apply the principles of the Bible that Jesus has given to us. I looked at that word compacted that where he mentions that, um, you know, fitly joined together and compacted by that which the, 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 the word literally means to drive together to unite. I know we may not spend a lot of time outside of the service seeing each other and and uh, and you know I'm not a I'm not a spiritual policeman so you know I don't make sure you're doing this and make sure you're doing that um, so we don't have a lot of maybe interaction with one another outside of uh, our regular service times but has the Holy Ghost ever led led uh, led one of us on your heart when you begin to pray or you're walking through the day and all of a sudden you, you, you know one of us pops in your mind and, and it's the Holy Ghost saying you know you need to pray and I actually said that to him I think this morning or yesterday I said oh Lord lay, lay me upon some lay me upon someone's heart to pray for me to cover me in prayer right now so what we're trying to do in response to the Holy Ghost is to be connected in the sense where we're driving this thing together. Praise God. That guy that sits on that huge fire engine, Sister Doty, that has to, he's way in the back. I mean, he's way back there. It seems like he's a mile away from where the driver is. But his goal to turn that wheel and bring that tail end of that, that fire engine when, when, it, when it gets ready to make that, that is a very important position to be in. And so, your position in the church, your position in the body is a very, very important position. And uh, it, it's not just cliches that I, I, I'm using tonight. 
I believe the Spirit of the Lord has placed us in this church, in his kingdom, in this building for such a time as this. I, I believe it, man, yes. I really believe it, brothers, yes. sisters. Jesus. It means to cause a person to unite with one in a conclusion or come to the same opinion to prove and to demonstrate. I want to read you verse 16 of, uh, of this Ephesians chapter 4 in the Passion Translation. It says, For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one. And every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all. And as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. It's like when you go to a natural well, you know, maybe some of your properties, you have a, a regular, you know, a natural well where you, know, you draw water from that well and bring that bucket of water up or whatever container of water is. As soon as that water comes out of the body of water down there, immediately, I mean, if it's a well that's being fed, immediately that water that was taken and placed in that container immediately is replaced with more water. You know what I'm talking about? Yes, sir. And it's the same way with, with the Holy Ghost. As we draw water, as we... We uh, draw in, in the house of God. We draw in his spirit. We, his spirit speaks to us. We, we flow in the Holy Ghost. It's natural for us to want to take that spirit of God that he's given to us and to give it out. That's the feeling that we feel. It's not just a, oh, wow, I witnessed to somebody. That, not, not praise. Man, that felt good. It's the natural process of give and take. I take the water, it immediately fills. So you want more of the Holy Ghost. How many need more of the Holy Ghost? I need more of the Holy Ghost. I want as much Holy Ghost as I can have. Well, the secret to getting more Holy Ghost is to give your Holy Ghost away. Let the Spirit of the Lord flow through you. Get, get in the habit of it. Get used to it. Train yourself. Let the Holy Ghost train you. Walk. Walk and talking in tongues. And just, you know, walk with a, uh, go through the supermarket just for the fun of going through the supermarket. Don't buy anything. Just go to look at people and get a sense of what is God doing in this building right now. Go someplace. Take a walk around a block or two. And, and just, and if you see somebody coming, there you go. Get a hold of Jesus. Father, have you chosen this person? What, what do you think? And, and sometimes the, they'll come up with a question. Sometimes they'll approach you and ask you something. And right away, the Spirit of the Lord is there. And you can give them an answer. It can be an answer. They're expecting a worldly answer. And you give them a heavenly answer. How many know what I'm talking about? And then it leads to, to something else. But that's how we've got to engage in the Spirit. We throw it out. He fills us back in. As you've heard the proverbial Dead Sea, the Dead Sea is the Dead Sea because there's no outlet for it to flow through. So it stagnates. It stinks. It's dead. And if we're not giving out our spirit, it's hard. It's, it, it's hard to, to walk with God. You, you, you just, you know, you come into church, you get, get filled with the Holy Ghost, you, you pray, you, you feel the presence of God, but you get out there and all of a sudden, by Monday morning, Tuesday the latest, it's like, man, I, just, uh, I don't feel what I felt Sunday. Well, how come? Because it's not being given out. And your spirit becomes stagnant. There's no freshness. There's nothing, there's no vitality that's there. Amen. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. Listen to what Peter says. He says, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has given us things and he asks us to be good stewards of what he's given to us. Again, you look at the parable of the talents. Every one of them received the same compliment. And one had five. The, the, the guy that had two didn't look at the guy that had five and said, oh, he's got five talents to give. I, I can't do anything. And that's, don't compare yourself with, with everybody. Don't compare yourself with nobody, really. 
only person you've got to compare yourself with is Jesus. Amen. 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 Yes. I want to be like him. I want to, that's his goal anyway, is to make us more like him. So focused on Calvary, so focused on the mission at hand. I just want to do my father's will. I don't do anything without my father initiating it. And Peter says, we've all received a gift. And the command of scripture is that we minister that, that gift one to another. I mean, again, I'll reference the experience in the house today and how, how, how long all of us have had the Spirit of the Lord and the Holy Ghost. I wonder how our, how our services really would, would mount up if every time we came together, it wasn't just one or two people praising the Lord, but we would all, all be lifting our voice to God. It's, well, I'm, I'm not like that, but... Talk to me after service. I got an answer for that. Amen. Sometimes it's like I'm ready to explode. The Holy Ghost is in this place. How can how can worship not be taking place? Huh? You know, how, how, I don't I don't get it. I don't understand it. And again, I'm not. I'll be the first one not to compare myself or expect everybody to act crazy and everything. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about heartfelt worship that comes from the heart. And if I can't do it in here, if I don't have gratitude enough to do it in here and lift my voice in here and worship God in here, you know what? That speaks volumes to him, not me. That speaks volumes to him. That tells me that you don't tap into that river and that well of living water very often. Because it's natural for it to splash everybody as it comes out. Amen. I'm not talking about anything you haven't heard. That's good. That's right. We're all ministers. Amen. And if we can openly praise God here and not be reserved in this place and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and thank Him and just whatever, worship Him from your heart. It's a command of Scripture. And to not move or not make any noise. Prayer is another arena. How can I talk to God without not opening my mouth? You say, well, I pray to God in my mind. Try having a conversation, talking to somebody out of your mind. See where that gets you. I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean here tonight. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get us used to the flow of the Spirit. We need to get the flow of the Spirit. If you get out of hand, don't worry about it. We'll take care of that. But I'm not concerned about that. We have to learn the flow of the Spirit. But your flow in the Spirit starts in your prayer time. And it comes into here. And if all of us begin to worship God and the atmosphere changes... And the angels fill this place up. They're going to be waiting for God to speak through us. And for God to operate through us. And God just may have you walk over to a brother or sister. And lay hands on them. And pray for them in Jesus name. And God will heal them on the spot. And they didn't even tell anybody they weren't feeling good. Or they weren't feeling down or whatever. Yes sir. Yes. Thank you yes. Jesus. You ever have a cut or something on your hand that really bothers you? I got a pain in this finger right here. I don't know what's there. Man, sometimes I grab stuff and I go, oh, man. I said, I said to my sweetie the other night, we're getting old, baby. We're getting old. But if there's a part of your body that hurts, you usually nurture it or take care of it. or I mean, you pay attention to it, I think. We're the body of Christ. Praise God. The Amplified translation of this verse says this. As each of you has received a gift, a particular spiritual talent, a gracious divine endowment, employ it for one another as befits good trustees of God's many-sided grace. Faithful stewards of the extremely diverse powers and gifts granted to Christians by unmerited favor. 
I don't know about you, but I surely, where I was in the world, I did not deserve Jesus to come along and pick me up right. and clean me up and set me on my way. Amen. But I am glad he did. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And yes, I fought him and resisted what he was trying to do in my life for many years. Maybe you all can say amen to that also. Amen. But I've got to ask myself, and I've been asking myself lately, what have I done with what he's given to me? Amen. What have I done? Amen. Yes, Pastor. What have I done? And like I said, this isn't, God doesn't put his people on a guilt trip. God gives his people empowerment. God's already spelled it out. You have power, you have my authority, you have my dominion. What you need to do is look to me as the author and finisher of your faith and let my faith be imparted into your faith and you live by my faith. Not your own, you live by my faith. How did Paul say it? I live by the life I live now. I don't, don't live on my own. I live by the faith of the Son. We need to live by his faith. His faith is always looking for opportunities. His faith is listening. His faith, his eyes are always, he goes to and fro, trying to show himself strong on someone's behalf. You and I was saved as part of an overall plan to win others. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1 and 15. This is a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it out of the New King James. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Let me interject something right now. A, a lot of times we feel incapable. There are times that I feel so incapable of, of doing the task at hand that it's very, very easy for me to talk myself out of pursuing that task because I just kind of ignore it and write it off. Hello? Yep. Yes. And... If you happen to be that type of person, I, I'm not a go-getter. You know what I mean by that? I, I'm, I'm not a go-getter. I just kind of float along and adjust. It can have its good benefits, but it can have its bad benefits. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting here tonight beating yourself up, saying, I, I just don't know if I can do this, I, this, this, I've been this way all my life, so on and so forth. Rebuke that thought in Jesus' name. Amen. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things are supposed to be passed away. Now, if I want to hold on to what I am, who I am, what I used, I can, and he won't do a thing about it. But if I believe the book that says I am a new creature in Christ, I can act differently, I can talk differently, I can think differently, I can pray differently. Now, there's a great, great advice. Timothy says this, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He, this is what he says. He, I'm the chief among sinners. That's exactly what Paul, can you imagine how the devil tried to heap guilt upon Paul because in his uh, theological and in intellectual brain, he really thought he was doing the will of God by rounding up these believers, these Christians, and bringing them to jail and actually having some of them killed. Can you imagine the heyday that Satan tried on his mind? And, and so he writes, he's saying to Timothy, I, I'm the chief among sinners. However, everybody say however. However. For this reason... I obtained mercy. God loves you and I. Thank you, Jesus. With a capacity and, and in a way that it is unfathomable for us to be able to grasp it, receive it, understand it. Jesus. 
And in the hour we're living in, we've got to quit looking at what we don't have and looking what we are not and begin to understand that he loves me enough that he wants me to be a participant with him in his plan. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, listen to him, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. What's long suffering? Patience. In me, Jesus might show all patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. So, Brother Mike, whether I think I can do it or not, whether I've tried to do it and failed, whether I don't think I can do it or not, it has nothing to do with me. He sees me for who I am. He sees me for what I am. And he's patient with me. And he loves me to the nth degree. And will do everything in his power to develop me into the vessel that he's chosen me to be. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Talk about win-win. And the best part of it, I don't have to be concerned about the results. Because the results are not my responsibility. He said, I'm a laborer together with him. He's not keeping tabs. Well, how many people did you win to the Lord? We're not going to stand before him and, and, and give the account of, well, you know, I, I, I tried 50 or 100 or whatever. No, he's going to say, were you faithful? Did you labor? Were you, were, you, were you praying for the lost? Were you, were, were you allowing me to speak through you? Were you looking for every opportunity because you're kingdom minded to, to share me with somebody so they would have the opportunity at least to choose? That's how I've been praying lately. I pray that people would be given opportunity to choose. Yes, save them. But if they don't want to be saved, they've had the opportunity to choose. That's right. Amen. The responsibility for saving is his and his yeah. alone. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jesus teaches in John 15 about the vine and the branch. To be in the vine and nourished by the Lord. If I am a branch and I'm connected to Jesus and I'm laying claim to be a follower of Jesus, a believer of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, then Jesus is going to feed me to the degree that that juice is going to flow from that vine into that branch, no matter where that branch is located. It could be across the room when the vine's here. But as long as that connection, the twists, the turns, as long as it's connected, that juice from that vine is going to make it to the very tip of that branch, and that branch is going to produce fruit. So it doesn't make a difference how far you, you think you are, how close you think you are, the ups, the downs, the twists, and the turns of life cannot, cannot separate the flow of the Holy Ghost coming from Him to touch you and minister to you and through you and by you. The only thing that can stop it is us. We cut it off. We give up. We say, I can't. And without a doubt, we are part of a spiritual movement. We are part of a spiritual movement that is empowered to become what God has always wanted us to become. It's there for the taking. It's there for the asking. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. And if we just ask and keep on asking and knock and keep on knocking. He said it in Revelation 3, his admonishment. If you open the door while I'm knocking on the door, I'm going to come in and I'm going to sup with you. He'll revolutionize your prayer life. I appreciate what Sister Sue said. Man, I, get on, I want to get home from work so I can be in his presence. All I want to do, I want to get home so I can be in his presence. That's a great attitude. The psalmist said it this way. God, you are my God. Early, I'm going to seek you. And my, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. There's no water in this life. There's no water in this world. Not anymore. Nothing satisfying is lasting in this world. But as a branch connected to Him, 
And to understand he's given me power, authority, dominion. It's when, it's when, it's when, it's when. I can fight the lies of the devil. I can fight the, the darkness. I can, I can bind things. I can lose things. He's given me that kind of power because he had that power when he walked on the earth. Praise God. I just need more of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now finally, the more Jesus I get, the bolder I get. Praise God. Yes, sir. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. What is the personality of Apostolic Temple? Stand with me if you will. What is the personality of Apostolic Temple? Every church has a personality. They really do. And the Holy Ghost is asking us collectively, but also individually. What is the personality? You know what I'm talking about because we've all judged people by their personality, haven't we? We've done it on the job. We do it with family. We do it with people at work. With some folks, you want to roll your eyes and say, oh, me. And others, you're attracted to them. You're drawn to them. Real revival is simpler than we think. Simpler than we think. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse uh, 5 and 6. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Who then is Mike Andre? Who then is Alan Rivera? We could throw our name right in that first sentence. Paul's asking the question, you know why? Because they were saying, oh, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm, I'm of this, and I'm of that. And there was big eyes and little U's. And there was division and schism in that particular body of that particular church. And Paul gives us a key here. He said, who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed. Nothing more exciting then you sharing your faith with somebody and they end up, they come to church. Mm -hmm. Ever bring somebody to church that you witnessed to or that you invited and they come in? You know, man, oh, I, I bet you you know how to pray then. Oh, Lord, touch them. Oh, Lord, let your word uh, minister to them. Uh, oh, Lord, fill them with the Holy Ghost and give them the desire to be baptized and, and so on and so forth. That's what Paul's saying, you know. Apollos and, and Paul, they were just ministers who, who some people believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. It's a question. I've planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Sister Sue, take these and give, give, give everybody one, please. The seven aspects of personal evangelism. There's the mandate, there's the motive, the means, the method, the ministry, the multiplication, the mentality. Every aspect of, 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 of these seven things, these seven aspects, I call them, of personal evangelism, the mandate. Do I, do I see it? Do, do I see the mandate from God that I'm to be, I'm to be involved in personal evangelism? Have I really felt it, the motive? Do, you know, have I really felt the, the motivation, if you please, to want to be used of Him? And, and I'm, I'm praying in that vein. I may even have to fast in order to, to, to kill this old flesh so my spiritual hearing will perk up a little, a little more sensitive. The means, do I realize that it, that it is possible? Pastor, order me one of those Bible study books. I'm, I'm going to find somebody that I can use it on. Matter of fact, get me two copies. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever I can do. If I'm going to pray that God opens the door. I'm going to pray that God gives me opportunity to share my faith. Amen. The method. Do I know how? If you don't know how, let's talk about it. Let's work together. Let, let's have Bible study together. You teach. Somebody else teach. We'll, we'll take turns. We'll learn. Kind of get it under our belt. 
say, well, I'm not so busy. I'm so busy. Well, eternity is going to be a real, real, real long time. Amen. The ministry, do I understand it? The multiplication, am I part? Am I part of what God is doing in this last hour? Am I just taking in, taking in, taking in, taking in? Or, or as part of the equation of multiplication, two plus two equals four, three plus three. Plus, am, I, am I part of the equation of what God is doing in this hour, what he wants to do in this hour? And the mentality, have I received it? Has God brought me to this juncture of my, my life, my walk with Him, my commitment to Him, my knowledge of Him, my empowerment of Him. Has God brought me to this place for such a time as this? Before it all, from a world perspective, come, comes crashing down? Praise God. Thank you. Why don't you lift your hands towards heaven? Let's talk to Him for a moment. In Jesus' name. If you want to be part of personal evangelism, you tell them that right now. And you might you might have to say, I don't know how it's, I'm going to do it, Father. I, I, I really don't know where to begin. I'm going to start tomorrow praying. I'm going to every day, I'm going to ask you, Jesus, to, to allow my path to cross somebody. I want ears to hear. I mean, whatever you've got to do, Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name that you would give the increase. Father, I lose the spirit of faith and I lose the spirit of evangelism in this house tonight. I believe, God, you have a plan for each and every one of us. I believe, God, you have a purpose for each and every one of us. And I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Ghost would do the work. The Holy Ghost would give the increase, Lord. We thank you, Father, for choosing us. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to be a part of such a great thing in this last hour. Oh, Lord Jesus, we don't want church. We don't want programs. We don't just want to go through the motions, my God. We want to be your body in the earth. We want you to manifest your kingdom through us. We want to see signs. We want to see wonders. We want to see the miraculous, my God. And I pray in Jesus' name, bring us to that place, Lord. Don't give up on us, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let the Holy Ghost flow, my God. Let your breath be upon each and every family represented by this congregation. I pray the angels of the Most High God will encamp about them, Lord. I pray your grace and your mercy and your peace that passes all understanding would be imparted to them, Father. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've given us so many promises, Father. You've given us so much for us to stand on, for us to believe in. And we receive it tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and praise the Lord and thank Him tonight. Thank you, my God. Thank you, my God. I 